God is going to give you special reward in Jesus' name. Amen. And then you influence all the other workers, those who are not here now, those who are joining us later, influence them, we're going out tomorrow. Faith. I will win souls to the Lord. The Lord bless you and bless your families. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your calling upon our lives. We thank you for the great work you have committed into our hands. Lord, we pray as we unite together to get this work done, the work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. Multitudes, numberless souls will come into the kingdom through us in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, that you put the word in our mouth. Unction with the word. Power of the word. Anointing with the word. And many will be converted in Jesus' name. Tonight, speak to us again. Like a father in heaven to our children here on earth, speak to your children. Like the head of the church to members of your church, speak to your church. And Lord, we pray you strengthen us to move out of this gospel message and bring souls into this kingdom. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 14. For the body is not one member but many. If the food shall say... Because I'm not of the of the I'm not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it not? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now. As God said, the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. Have you noticed that the word body appears in verse 14, appears in verse 15, appears in verse 16, is there in verse 17, is there in verse 18. Notice again, verse 19, it says, If they were all one member, where were the body? But now are, are they many members, yet but one body? Do you notice the word body every, everywhere there? Give me an answer. Yes. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Ignore again the head to the feet. I have no need of thee, nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble and necessary. And those members of the body, that's the word again, which will think to be less honorable upon these will bestow more abundant labor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered, tell me, the body together, having them, having given more abundant honor to that part which large. They, that there should be no schism, that is division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Body of Christ and members in particular. As you look at the passage, you see that the church is compared, is likened to the human body, having many members. And as you think about the members of the body, the feet, the hands, the eyes, the uh, nose or nostrils, and the ears, the mouth, every part of the body, internal and external, you see that those members of the body, they are there for a purpose. 
It's not just that the leg will walk. The, the legs are walking somewhere and they're walking on purpose and they're moving the body to a particular destination. It's not just the hand that it will be, the hands will be active. The arms and the hands are active for a particular purpose to achieve something you know, for the whole body. It's not just that the ears are hearing sound. Anybody can hear sound, but to hear the sound so as to act on the sound we're hearing. And not just that uh, the mouth is speaking. Any time and every time any member of the body does something, you know, it's done on purpose. It's done so that the whole body will be carried from this place to the next place. Activity for productivity. That's the purpose. And the same thing for members of the body of Christ. Because now you've learned that the members of the body of Christ, they're united together. They're put together. They're set together for a purpose. And the purpose is to make progress. That's why tonight we're looking at the purposeful unity of the king's servants. The purposeful unity of the king's servant. Really, as we talk about the church, there are many metaphors and many illustrations concerning the church. The church is likened to a body, like I've read just to you now. The church is likened to a family, a family of father and mother and children, and that whole family united together. Again, the unity of the family is for a purpose. The church is likened to a flock. A flock of sheep with a shepherd over them, that's also for a purpose. Have you ever seen a shepherd that is going ahead and then the herds or the cattle or the sheep, they are following, they are going somewhere. And the reason why they are together is to follow the shepherd and to go to the right destination. In fact, the church is also likened to an army. An army is there not for decoration. An army is there to do something definite. And the army is uh, united for a particular purpose. As we look at the church, the church is like into a kingdom. A kingdom of priests with Christ as the head and Christ as the high priest. And again, the priesthood is uh, for a particular purpose. And the church is like into a holy nation. A holy nation. That is, you have a nation like the church here now. I mean, the church in Nigeria is a nation within the nation. And that nation too has a divine purpose. It taught to achieve. The, the church is like into a building. And you know, the building we have here is for a purpose. Any building that you build, you put one block upon the other, and then you cement them together, unite them together, glue them together for a purpose. And so, as you look at the illustration of the church, the church is there for a purpose. The church is a body. Look at uh, that passage again. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in verse 14. It says, for the body is not one member, but many. Look at verse 27. Now, ye are the body of Christ. Members are members in particular. So number one, the church is likened to, tell me, a body. Number two, the church is likened to a family. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, I read from verses 14 and 15. When you think about the church, you're thinking about the family. In your own family, you want unity. If you're married, your wife, you with your children, you don't want, uh, you know, the family scattering, disunited, fighting each other, gossiping about each other. You want your own family to be united. And you want love as a cement that will glue the family members together. In Ephesians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 14. It says, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, look at this verse 15, of whom, tell me, 
the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. It's telling us that the church is a family. And like we want love, we want fellowship, we want communion, and we want compassion, and we want a united effort in our family. So in the family of God, in the family of Christ, he wants a unity. And it's like into a flock. I want you to come to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, the church is also a flock. And we're united together. And it is not like, you know, I have my goal and you have your goal and had my direction you have your direction and then the flock scattered about one going this way and the other going the other way the flock is united and in the same way the church that is likened to a flock should be united look at luke chapter 12 verse 32 fear not little flock it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom where we'll possess the kingdom You'll be part of that kingdom. I'll be part of that kingdom. I come to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. The flock, the fold, the same thing. As we come to John chapter 10, I'm reading here from verse 16. John chapter 10, verse 16. All the sheep I have, which are not of this fold. When you hear the fold, you hear the flock, the same thing. Then it says, um, it says, All the sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. It will happen through you. Amen. I must bring. That means, must bring them in. It says, they belong to him. It says, he died for them. It says he shed his blood for them, and they, have, they should be part of this fold. Look at that again. Another sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. Look at this, look at this, and there shall be, tell me, one fold, and tell me the rest. One shepherd. There shall be one fold and one shepherd. You see the intention of Christ. You see the desire of Christ. You see the expectation of Christ. He wants the whole church to be like a flock. A flock, one fold, and then just one shepherd. I said the church is like into an army. We're coming to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, and we're reading from verse 10. It's a picture of the church, a picture of people that are there to catch, you know, those who are outside and win more territory and win more victory for the king, the king of kings and the lord of lords. It tells us in Ezekiel chapter 37, and in verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, we shall live, and stood up, well stand up, will not be weak, our knees will not be weak, our spine will not be weak, our backbone will not be weak, our stamina will not be weak, our mind will not be weak, will not be weak inside our heart, you'll be strong. I said you will be strong. You'll be a strong soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that verse 10 again. It said, so, so I prophesied. That's personal. You will prophesy. You will proclaim. You will declare the word of God effectively and fearlessly in Jesus' name. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And breath came into them and they lived and stood up upon their feet. Tell me. You can say better than that. An exceeding great army. Army of soldiers. You know, we're supposed to be soldiers of Christ and soldiers of the cross. It tells us in Second Timothy chapter 2. See what the Lord calls us. Soldiers in the army of Christ. Soldiers in the army under the captain. And have you found any so any army divided that will win any victory? No. That will win any battle? No. It is the unity of the army. And you know the army at the 
disciplined people, the soldiers, the discipline, and their discipline gets them united under their captain. Look at Second Timothy chapter two, and I'm reading here from verse three. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We're well, soldiers in the army of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be united. I said we're going to be united. We're a kingdom of priests. It tells us in First Timothy, uh, First Peter, chapter two. First Peter, chapter two. I'm reading from verse five. First Peter, chapter two, verse five. It says, "Ye also are lively stones, and built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood. Holy priesthood." You see, if there is no holiness in the midst of the children of God, it brings disunity. It brings disunity. While one is honest, the other one is dishonest. While one is pure, the other one is impure. While one is, uh, you know, foregoing and zealous, the other one is lukewarm. And we're all scattered. But thank God, we will not be scattered. We're going to be united. And as we're united, we're united in doctrine. We're united in worship. We're united in love. We're united in the calling the Lord has given us. And it says we're holy priesthood to offer all spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Understand what the church is likened to? The church is likened to a body. The church is like into a family. The church is like into a flock. The church is like into an army. The church is like into a kingdom of priests. The church is like into a holy nation. A holy nation. Look at uh, First Peter chapter two. I'm reading from verse nine. First Peter chapter two, verse nine. But she a chosen generation. Thank God I am chosen. I say, thank God I am chosen. Are you chosen? You fulfill the purpose of your choice in Jesus' name. It says, a royal priesthood and holy nation. Look at that. And holy nation. A nation that is not united cannot go very far. A peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Are you part of us? I said, are you part of the church? A part of the holy nation, there will be holiness in your life. Amen. Holiness on your tongue. Amen. Holiness in your activities. Amen. Holiness in every area of your life in Jesus' name. Amen. You can give a better amen than that. Amen. Uh, we're coming now to number seven is a building. We are a building. A building. And when you look at a building, one block does not make up a building. And blocks that are piled together, there are many, there are, there are thousands. They don't make a building. It's when you have a foundation. And then you put this block there, then you put some cement and put another block, and then put some cement, put another one on the side, and put some cement and put another one. It's as you cement them together, as you join them together. And the one below is not complaining that, uh uh. Why is it that one they put on top of me? There'll be no house. And why is it this one is beside me? There'll be no house. And there's no jealousy between, uh, you know, those blocks. How is it that that block is by the window? How is it that that block is by the door doorway? And everybody that passes will appreciate that he is the one holding the thing. And I'm just at the pantry at something there. There's no jealousy or comparison like that. There's no carnality that will say, I don't want to be this. I don't want to be that. They're all united together. That's that is why we have this beautiful building. And your life and your church, local church, will be a beautiful building for Christ in Jesus' name. Uh, look at this, look at this in First Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 3. In First Corinthians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. We are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Yeah, God's building. That means then uh, we're just the blocks of the building and we must stay together and we must uh, unite together and we must fulfill the purpose of the building together. The church is likened to the body. 
whose head, uh, whose, uh, whose members are purposely, purposefully united together. The church is like into a family whose head is Christ. The church is like into a flock whose shepherd is the Lord. The church is like into an army whose captain is Christ our Lord. The church is a kingdom of priests whose high, high priest is Jesus Christ. And the church is like into a holy nation whose king is Jesus. The church is like into a building whose foundation and cornerstone is Christ. And when we allow Christ Christ to have his rightful place in the body, his rightful place in the family, his rightful place in the flock, his rightful place in the army. He has his rightful place in the kingdom of priests and will allow Christ to have his rightful place in the holy nation, his rightful place at the foundation, at the cornerstone of the building then will fulfill the purpose for which we are called. The human body is so created that all the members are united together. The unity is natural. There's no struggling. It's not, I'll try to be united. No. In the, in the members of the body, the hands are not seen. We will try. We had a message today. We will try. The legs are not seen. Okay, okay. I think I will overlook uh, how the hands are moving. I think I'll overlook how the tongue is taking all the food. I think I'll overlook how the eye sees everything and then I'm just there. Not at all. The body is naturally united together. And the unity that is natural, that's the only way each member will contribute to the function of the whole body and that's the way we are created so that we can fulfill the destiny of the body and this church deeper life bible church was restored by god for a purpose and you are a member and you are going to be part of fulfilling that purpose in jesus name through us in this nation through us in this continent of africa and through us in all the continents of the world will fulfill the divine purpose for which the church was established. And thank God you are part of it. Amen. I appreciate you that you are there. I love you that you are there. And I understand that you have something to contribute that no other person can contribute. Am I talking about you there? Yeah. there? There is something the hand can do that the feet cannot do. There's something the legs can do that the hands cannot do. And there's something the eyes can do in the body that the ears cannot do. And the ears have a special function that the mouth cannot perform. And the tongue has a special function activity that um, you know the intestines cannot perform. The kidneys have a special function that the heart cannot perform. And the heart has a special function that the bones cannot perform. Every member of the body is there for a special purpose and you are there for a special purpose. You will not overlook your own calling in the body in Jesus name. Tonight again the purposeful unity of the king's servants. The purposeful unity of the king's servants. Three things we're looking at. Number one the practical unity of humble workers. The practical unity of humble workers. You see, the um, unity is a practical thing. It's not uh, something theoretical. We heard about it on Saturday at the training. No, it's supposed to, you know, get through to the house fellowship and the zona and the district and the local church and the group church and the church in the region and the church in the state and the whole church worldwide. Is a practical unity. Point number two, the productive unity of helpful, harmless witnesses. Witnesses we are, and we're supposed to witness to the glory of God. We're supposed to witness to what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. And there is a productive unity. You look at the hands and the feet and the ears and members of the body as they are productively united together. That's how the body makes a progress. I think about who you are, whatever your profession. Let's say you're a student, for example, your brain, 
and it's good and your eyes are good and your ears are good and your hands to write and your feet to walk to the place you ought to walk to and then your nose you are breathing everything is working together to give you the success you desire you will be successful are the uh, youth leaders here today where are you i see success on your on your way you will succeed in jesus name but you see every part of your body every part of uh, who you are your of your personality comes into this uh, driver and into this achievement and we who are fathers and mothers and we who are professionals everything we have in the body contributes to the progress we have point number two the prog the productive unity of helpful and the harmless witnesses. Point number three now, the pastoral unity. A uh, father is a pastor over his family. And then the, you know, those who are sectional leaders were pastors over those various sections. In the children's section, you are pastors there. You section were pastors there. And women are pastors over the women in their zones, in their districts. And uh, all of us were pastors. And because we're pastors, there ought to be pastoral unity of honest, holy, heaven watch watchmen the pastoral unity of honest holy heaven watch watchmen we're going to be united and our, and our unity will be a unity of purpose and a unity of progress and a unity of productivity we're coming to number one tell me your number one there the practical unity of humble workers. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 18. Look at what God has done. It says, but now God has set the members, every one of them in the body as it has pleased him. Look at that verse. It says, it is God who has set you there. It is God who has put you there. A God, um, you know, had a purpose and he had a goal. And whatever you are in the body of Christ, whatever you are doing in the body of Christ, you cannot say, how is this? It's like the little finger complaining, why am I a little finger? You have a purpose there. It's like the thumb saying, why am I the thumb? You have your own purpose. There's a goal there. It's like the middle finger saying, why am I just the longest? I don't like my height. I don't like how tall I am. I don't like how long I am. No, God has set everyone members in the body as it has pleased him why has he said them in the body to start with let's see that the lord expects that in the members there will be humility look at this look at the, look at the expression of humility i'm reading here from verse uh, from verse 15 if the food shall say because i am not the hand i am not of the body is it therefore not of the body and that's like somebody saying i feel inferior I feel unqualified. I feel not a match to the other people. And because I am not at the hand, then I'm not of the body. There's nothing I can do. There's something you can do. You will be useful. I said you will be useful. When we get to heaven, you'll be surprised the great rewards you are going to have. He said, is this all for me? Is this all for me? All those great rewards will be for you in Jesus' name. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. And if the ear will, shall say, because I am not the eye, I'm not so important, I'm not the eye, I'm a, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? You see, there are people, they are always uh, comparing you know, the role of so-and-so and then my own role, the function of so-and-so and my own function and the ability of so-and-so and, -so and uh, my own ability. And therefore, they say, I'm discouraged because, you see, they just put me there. No, we didn't put you there. Who put you there? Yeah, that's what Vasitin said. God put you there. You will succeed there. 
you will function there you stop looking at what you don't have you stop looking at the position of other people you look at the previous position you have you function there look at verse 17 if the whole body one eye where were they hearing and if the whole body were hearing where were they smelling go to verse 19 in verse 19 if they were all one member everybody doing the same thing you know? that's the most important thing that's the most important thing you know? you know the ear wants to turn to become eye the mouth wants to turn to become eye the hands want to turn to become an eye and the legs the feet want to turn to become an eye there'll be a monster there'll be nobody but you see it is because of the different functions of the body that's why we keep the function the lord has given us look at verse 20 but now at they many members, yet but one body were united. And the eye cannot say, no matter who we are, the hand cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Again, look at this one. This one is very important. Are you there? The second part of uh, verse 21. Can you read that for me? Where are you reading? I can't recognize your voice. No, again, the head. Is the head important? Is the brain important? Is the head that contains the eyes and the nose and the mouth and the ears? And now the head is so big and the head is saying, hey, feet, get away. I don't need you. Can the head say that? A head without hands, a head without uh, the, you know, the trunk of the body, a head without legs, you'll not get anywhere. Even if you are the head, you know, some of us who are pastors, some, you know, some of us sometimes will become, uh, allow my word, please, uh, will become hot headed. And then we say, You people there, if you are not going to do what I said, go out up there. No, they will not go out. Don't go out. This is your church. I said, This is your church. Nobody will drive you out. And you know, it is wrong for the pastor, it is wrong for the head to say, I have no need of him, I have no need of her. God needs every one of us. He says, no, again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. He's talking about humility. We should be humble. We should not be so proud and so lifted up and so high and so self-exalted that we say that we don't need some other people there will be humility all our workers will be humble i will be humble i said i will be humble if the father is humble the children must be humble if the pastor is humble, the members must be humble. Now, many times when we say humble, humble, humble yourself, we don't understand what is humility. H, not haughty, not high-minded, not hot-headed. That's what humility means. That H in humility, you are not hot-headed. You don't just rise up, drive everybody, and then impose yourself on everybody. You are not haughty. You're not proud. You're not high-minded. You, in that word, humble, means you are not unconcerned. There are some people, once, you know, they are right, I have my role, I fulfill my role, I'm not concerned about other people. No, you there means you're not unconcerned. It means you're not unyielding. You see, if somebody is unyielding, that person is proud. That person is haughty. That person is pompous. He's unyielding. He doesn't yield to appeal. He doesn't yield to, even when you appeal to them, and you beg them, and you plead with them, please, my brother, please, my son. They say, no, I will have my way. That's not humility. Because if you are humble, you will not be unconcerned about the feeling of other people. You will not be unyielding. You will not be ungovernable. Ungovernable. There's some people, you can't govern them. You can't direct them. You can't lead them. They're ungovernable. But you see, when we're humble, you're there. And if we say, sit down, by the grace of God, you're sitting down. If we say, stand up, by the grace of God, you're standing up. And whatever it is, we're told to do because you're humble, you're not ungovernable. You aim there in the word humble means you are not magnifying self. 
you are not magnifying self. There are some people, they look so big as if the door is made for only themselves. That they won't allow other people to pass. And we're lining at the back there. And the fellow, you know, is big as that just stands at the doorway there. We cannot even pass because the man is so big and he will not make way for other people. That's not humility. In a humility, we're not magnifying self. Humility does not minimize others. Minimize others. You know, sometimes the people, sometimes they look at somebody like this as if the ground should open and swallow you up. I don't be intimidated, intimidated by anybody's look. I said you will not be intimidated by anybody's look. You're important in the house of God. You're essential in the house of God. And what God has appointed for you to do, you will do. Yeah. You will not fail. Yeah. There's a reward waiting for you in heaven, and somebody belittling you, minimizing you, will not hinder your progress in Jesus' name. Yeah. M, he does not magnify self. He does not minimize others. He does not murmur. That's, that's it. Somebody who is humble is not murmuring. You know why people murmur? Why did they keep me this way? Uh, this seat is, uh, you know, is uh, too far apart. It's too far away. This one. Why did they keep me this position? Why did they keep me this, uh, this privilege? Why is it they gave so and so this? I came before him. You know, humility will not uh, murmur. And B, humility is not boastful. Not boastful. If you know what I will do, and you know what I can do, and it's not bullying. You know, people, they, they, they see somebody get out of there and they shout on them as if they are driving a dog. They don't have respect for other people. That's not humility. As we're workers and we're united together, we'll be humble. There'll be no boasting. It's not boastful. It's not bullying. It's not bloated. Bloated. You know, the people who are bloated, uh, sometimes if you make a mistake, you bought a loaf of bread, and then as you have the bucket of water, and without uh, you knowing, all of a sudden the bread dropped where? In the, in the bucket of water. And before you pick it up, it's bloated. It's so big like this, and you've lost that loaf of bread and when somebody is bloated like that we've lost him we've lost him he cannot do what he ought to do in the kingdom if you are humble you are not uh, haughty you are not high-minded you are not hot-headed if you are humble you are not unconcerned you are not unyielding you are not ungovernable if you are humble you are not magnifying self you are not minimizing others you are not murmuring if you are humble you are not boastful you are not bullying you are not bloated if you are humble l you are not lawless you see, lawless people, they're proud. It's like, I will do what I will do. Let them come and touch me and let me see. I will go where I will go. Let them talk and I will see. And I will, I'm going to disregard their instruction. I'm going to disobey everything they are saying. And let them come to me and challenge me and I will show them who I am. He is not humble. A humble person will not be lawless. A humble person is not loud mouthed. Loud mouthed. You know, there's some people, some things they say, you'll be, you'll be shocked. You say, Who is he talking to like that? They'll say, Well, that's his dad. And his dad takes that. Who is she talking to like that? That's her mother. And the mother takes that. Who is she reacting to like that? That's her boss. And she, she says, if you want to stop my appointment, that's okay, that's okay. In fact, I'm ready to even go. A humble person is not loud mouth. A humble person is not lying. A humble person is not lying. E, a humble person is not excluding others. I can do everything. I don't need any help in hand. All of you, go and find what you are going to do. I am here. And since I am here, I'm going to do everything. No, a humble person doesn't act like that, excluding others. A humble person is not exaggerating self-importance, self-importance, exaggeration. If you know the mountain I can climb, 
If you know the places I can get to, if you know, if I write any application anywhere, my English, my vocab, everything I write there, I, trust me, this will happen. A humble person does not exaggerate self, self-importance. A humble person does not exhibit pride, exhibit pride. You see, if we're going to be united as workers, we will be humble and God will keep you humble. I say God will keep all humble. Hey, look at the attitude of a humble person. I'm coming to Second Samuel chapter ten. Second Samuel chapter ten. I'm reading from verse eleven. Second Samuel chapter ten. And we're reading from verse eleven. It says, "And you said, if the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me." That's a humble person. Well, I have this work to do. I have this assignment to carry out. I, I don't know whether I can do it all by myself. I'll try, I'll try, I'll try my best. But if the Syrians are too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. Look at this. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. That's good. That's good. You see, you tell other people we're united together. If that's too strong for you, I'll come and give a helping hand. And of course, I'll tell you, if this is too much for me, I will invite you. You will give me a helping hand. We're coming to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, the practical unity of humble workers. In Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 3. In Romans chapter 12 verse 3, it says, For I say, through the grace that is given to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And not to, and then he goes on uh, to say, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. You have a measure, I have a measure. The measure of work, the measure of assignment, the measure of trust, the measure of a duty. God has assigned to everyone a measure of faith. And when you keep to that measure, and I keep to my own measure, we're going to finish the work. Look at verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teaches on teaching. That is, we're not uh, contradicting each other. We're not hindering each other. We're not uh, minimizing, retarding each other. I'm not stopping you. You're not stopping me. I'm not hindering you. You're not hindering me. I'm not in your way. You're not in my way. That's the humility and that's the unity once with us. The Zona leader is doing his work. And the women reps are doing their work. And uh, the uh, women coordinator is uh, doing her work and the coordinator pastor is doing his work and we're all following our rank and we're all following uh, everything we ought to do and we're not trying to hinder the other person look at verse 7 or ministry let us wait on our ministry or he that teaches on teaching or he that exhorted on exhortation he that giveth let him do it with simplicity he that ruleth he that that leads with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Let love be without pretense. Let love be without hypocrisy. And the Lord will keep us united together in Jesus' name. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Look at this verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love kind, compassionate, nice, friendly, in good fellowship, there'll be unity. And then it says in the latter part of that verse 10, in honor, what? In honor, what are you going to do? 
preferring one another. Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 3. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, still talking about our, our, ourselves as workers, humble workers, and then we have practical unity. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation but he took upon him the form of a servant he took that voluntarily and were to follow christ and take that voluntarily and then it says uh, a bit, to be a, a form of a servant uh, verse, uh, verse, uh, verse 7 uh, but made himself of no reputation but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men look at verse 8 and being found in fashion as a man he what did he do humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore because of that voluntary humility God has highly exalted him. The Lord will exalt you. The Lord will promote you. But understand, before honor is humility. And he has given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. The unity of members in the human body is practical. And therefore, the unity in our church, local church, district church, group church, the city church, and the regional church, and the whole state church, and the nation, the whole of deeper life in the nation. The unity should be, number one, practical. Number two, the unity should be purposeful. Purposeful. We're united so we can get the work done. The Lord has given us a great commission. And this great commission can only be achieved if we are practically, purposefully united together. Practical number one. Purposeful number two. Productive number three. The unity we're talking about is productive. It's not passive it's not inactive. It's not unity in idleness. Each member works in harmony with all the other members. And then a great work will be done in Jesus' name. You'll be a part of it. Your hand will not be away from the work. Your part will not be taken away from the work. We'll work and we're going to be productive in Jesus' name. Point number two now. Point number two. The productive unity of helpful, harmless witnesses. The productive unity of helpful, harmless witnesses. We're coming back to First Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 18. First Corinthians chapter 12. We're reading from verse 18. It tells us in verse 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, but now, when? I said when? Now. Now. You see what God has done, but now, as God said, members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him, as it has pleased him. If we understand ver that verse, we'll never complain. If we understand that verse, we'll never compete with anyone or with each other. If we understand that verse, we'll never condemn anyone. If we understand uh, this verse, we'll never criticize anyone. God puts you where you are. I'm doing more than they're doing. God give you the wisdom, give you the strength, give you the intelligence, and give you the opportunity. He is not as uh, fast as I am. God, that's how God made him. And this is how God made you. There'll be no comparison. There'll be no criticism. And there'll be no complaint when we understand. But now, in our local church, as we see, uh, you know, those uh, singers, uh, what they sing, uh, you'll praise God for them. 
And tomorrow, you'll have more appreciation for their singing in Jesus' name. As we see our ushers, that's what God has given them to do. You'll have appreciation for them in Jesus' name. As security people, our youth, our children, everyone, our women too, the great thing God has given them, you will appreciate everyone. You will not be, you know, looking down anyone, finish and go. Uh, leave that place and all that. Let them have their time. And as they have their time and do what they're doing, uh, God will use you, God will use them. And God will move the whole church forward through every one of us in Jesus' name. But now as God search members, every one of them in the body as it has pleased him. Look at verse 28. Verse 28 and God has search everybody tell me as says some in the church first apostles. You see that's what God has done. It's God that set those apostles, number one, in the church. Secondly, prophets. It's God that set them there. Are they counselors? God set them like that. Are they proclaimers of the truth of the word? God set them like that. And then it says, thirdly, teachers. Teachers. God set them, teachers, in the church. And what God has set them to do, the teacher does not, uh, you know, teach, uh, behave like an evangelist. The evangelist does not preach like an apostle. The apostle does not minister like a local pastor. Each one God has set in the church. And what God has set them to do, you will do. What God says you to do, you have the liberty to do what you are supposed to do. And what God has set the other person to do, he has the liberty, he has the freedom to do what God has set him to do. And uh, you know, the hand will not be afraid of the legs. The ears will not be afraid of the eyes. And the mouth will not be afraid of the, you know, the intestine. That you know, if I do this, no, you are set to do your work. And what the Lord has set you to do, you will do it confidently. You will do it fearlessly. You will do it without fear, without favor. You will do it without any restriction. And you will do it without thinking of what will they say? How will they think? How will they react? You have liberty to do everything the Lord has given you to do in Jesus' name. And when you do it the way the Lord has set you to do it, it will succeed. It will prosper. And the prosperity of the work in the hands of every one of us will bring a corporate unity and a corporate success in Jesus' name. Look at this again. It says, and God has said some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, and thirdly teachers, and then after that miracles. Look at that. Many people think that miracles are more important than teaching. But it says, uh, first of all, apostles. Secondly, prophets, and thirdly, teachers, and then it says, after that, which means that uh, it says that miracles are not, uh, you know, they are not to take the place of teaching. After that, miracles, and the gifts of healing, look at that, and helps, look at that, and government, that means administration, and diversities of tongues. Verse 29, are all apostles? You didn't answer? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? As, uh, have all gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? No, God has said, some in the church as this, some in the church as that, some in the church as that, and there's no carnal comparison. It tells us you know, we must be honest in the work he has given us to do. It is the honesty that makes the watchman to be the real watchman and to do the work successfully. We're coming to Second Corinthians chapter 13, verses 7 and 8. Second Corinthians chapter 13. I'm reading from verses 7 and 8. It it says, now I pray to God that she do no evil. You will not do any evil. Yeah. No, that we should appear approved. Not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest in your work, in the house fellowship, 
when your local pastor is there, when your local pastor is not there, when we see you, when we don't see you, it says that we should be honest, though we be a strip of base. It says in verse 8, for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. You'll not do anything against the truth. And look at verse 11 here. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. And then he goes on to say, be of one mind, live in peace. That's the unity he expects all the members and all the workers and all the watchmen to have. And it says, and all the witnesses to have. And it says, will be of good comfort, of one mind, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. The Lord is with you. And the work of God will prosper in our hands together in Jesus' name. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Reading from verse 9. It tells us in verse 9, two are better than one. Two are better than one. In the work of evangelism, two are better than one. That's why you are going out tomorrow with other people. Amen. You're not saying, I'll do it my own time. I don't have time now after the service. You'll have time tomorrow. Amen. Am I talking to somebody there? Amen. Unity tomorrow in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we're united together and we reach out to disable tracks and bring souls into the kingdom, this work will move forward through all of us together in Jesus' name. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. They have a good reward for their labor. The Lord will reward you. He reward you with progress. He reward you with success. He reward you with achievement. And the joy of result, good result, will be in your life in Jesus' name. Look at verse 10. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, and they brought woe unto him that is alone. When he falleth, for he has not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have a heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, the two shall withstand him, and the threefold cord is not quickly broken. That talks about our unity. And it talks about us that we're going to be honest and we're going to be helpful as well as harmless. We're coming to First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 12. First Chronicles chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 17. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 17. 12. 17. It, it's still talking about the fact that we help other people to achieve. We help other people to move forward in the great work the Lord has committed into our hands together to do. We're coming to First Chronicles chapter 12. What verse are you looking for? It says, And David went out to meet them and answered and said unto them, If ye become peaceably unto me to help me, to help me, to help me, mine heart shall be need unto you. But if you become to betray me to mine enemies, if you become to hinder me, to hinder my progress, if you become to weaken me, to weaken me on the battlefield, if you become to stop my progress seeing there is no wrong in my hands, the God of our fathers look thereon and rebuke it. Look at their answer in verse 18. Then the spirit came upon Amasai, who was chief of the captains, and he said, Thine we are, David, and on thy side, Thou son of Jesse, peace, peace be unto thee, and peace be to thine helpers. Help us. We help each other to move forward. We help each other to be strong. We help each other to progress. We help each other to bear fruit. For thy God helpeth thee. And David received them and made them 
captains of his band. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, and they helped David, will help one another, will support one another, will assist one another, and will move each other forward in Jesus' name. Did I hear a good amen from the house? And he helped David against the band of the rovers. For they were all mighty men of valor and were captives of, in the host. For at that time, day by day, there came to David to do what? They'll help you. I will help you. You will help me. We'll help each other. In the house fellowship, you help each other. In the zone, you help each other. In the district, you help each other. In the various sections where you are, you help each other. It is as we help each other that the work will make progress. It says to help him until it was a great host like the host of God. That help will not be far away. Uh, uh, let's look at let's look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 26. Acts chapter 18. We're looking at uh, verse 26. It says in verse 26, and he began, he's talking about Apollos, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla her, had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. They helped him to increase in knowledge. They helped him to have assurance of the real gospel, the deep gospel. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him who when he was come, when he was come, because Aquila and Priscilla had helped him, he now in turn helped them much which have believed through grace. And he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. And uh, as we all do the work together and we take this word to our neighborhood and to our communities, many people will come to know the Lord through you, through me, through us Amen. and we'll help each other to become effective witnesses in jesus name Amen. we're looking at psalm 68 psalm 68 i'm reading from verse 11 psalm 68 verse 11 it tells us here psalm 68 reading from verse 11 it says the lord gave the word the lord has given us the word the word of repentance he has given us. And the word of faith in Christ he has given us. It says the Lord gave the word and great was the company of those that published it. Are you part of that congregation? Are you part of that assembly? You'll do your part and everybody will do their part. And as we all do our parts together, many souls will come into the kingdom in Jesus' name. Have you noticed that members of a human body help one another to make others function at their best? Look up here for a moment. Let's say, for example, you want to run. And you say, well, it's my legs that are running. And you fold your hands in front and you are running. Will you run well? When you release your hands and those hands are moving as your legs are moving, that's when you run properly. Let's say you want to drive and you say, well, it's my hand that is holding the steering and you close your eyes. Will you drive? No. Your eyes have to look and look ahead even though it's your hand holding the steering and your legs that is doing whatever. Your eyes have to also cooperate. It is a coordination and it is the cooperation of all the members together that will help you to do whatever you're going to do and function well. Helpful members, harmless members, harmonious members working together will give us much progress and much productive Activity. Each member forgets itself. 
the legs will forget themselves and the hands will forget themselves. Just, uh, you know, as whatever you're doing, all the members are getting involved, but they forget themselves. They are lost in service, unconscious, unconsciously. They are laboring to serve others. And that's the attitude we ought to have in the work God has given to our hands to do. We forget ourselves. We forget, you know, I want to be happy. I want to be joyful. I want to be this and that. Forget all about that and function and help other people. When you forget yourself and you help other people, the whole body will make progress. Actually, when you think about the body, the strong members compensate for the feebleness of others. The strong members. I'm so strong, you have to compensate for the feebleness of others. Self-effacing, self-forgetting, self-sacrificing. Other members and other departments relieve others, receive others, and receive sufficient help and strength and upliftment to produce maximum result. And from this time, we're going to produce maximum result. Our local churches will produce maximum results. And all our various sections will produce maximum results in Jesus' name. So it should be in the church, Christ's own body. So it should be. And it will be like that in Jesus' name. And we're coming to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14. Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 14. It says, do how many things? All things without murmurings and disputings. You know, if we spend the first 30 minutes arguing, murmuring, complaining, pointing at each other, this and that. We well, wasted 30 minutes of our time. And then later now, with grudges, we we'll go to do the work and we we'll have something in our heart against our fellow brother, against our fellow sister. That's not how to work. It says from now on, do you how many things? Without what? And without what? We'll not fight with our leaders in the local church. No murmuring anymore. No complaining anymore. No arguments anymore. And it says that ye may be blameless. That means when we're murmuring, there's, no, there's blame. It means when we're arguing, there's blame. It means when we're disputing, argumentative, there's blame. But it says if there is no murmuring, if there's no disputing, that she may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and Verse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. You all shine. Yeah. Holding forth, what are you holding forth? The word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. You will not run in vain, yeah. and you will not uh, labor in vain. Yeah. Productive, the unity of helpful harmless witnesses point number three now the pastoral unity we're going to be united we're united already pastoral unity of honest holy heavenward watchmen we're coming to first corinthians chapter 12 first corinthians chapter 12 i'm reading from verse 18 first corinthians you'll never forget this verse I said you'll never forget this verse. We've read it often and of over and over so that you will not forget. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and reading from verse 18. It says, but now as God said, members, every one of them in the body as it has pleased him. As it has pleased you. As it has pleased who? God. He is God. Allow him to be God. He is a creator. Allow him to be creator. He is a most high. Allow him to be the most high. He is a Christ, the head of the church. Allow him to be the head of the church. It says, but now, as God said, members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. And I pray that every work we do, it will be to please the Lord. Because he has chosen all the members to please him. You'll encourage all the members to please him. 
You'll encourage all the workers to please him. And you'll encourage everybody you know to please him so that everyone will say, I know God has put me here. I know God has given me this assignment to please him. And I'm going to do everything to please him. You'll please him in Jesus' name. I'm coming to First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 7. See how the work will be done. And how we need to be honest. And we need to be holy. And we need to be heavenward. And di di directing the people. And leading the people in the direction of heaven. And leading the people into righteousness, into holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Helping the people that their concentration and their focus will be God. And then they will please God in everything they do. First Thessalonians chapter 2. We're looking at it from verse 8. Look at it from verse 8, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 8. It's talking about the attitude of, uh, you know, the watchmen, the attitude of the leaders, the attitude of the preachers. And what ought to be your attitude and my attitude? It says, for so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not only the gospel of God only, but tell me, also our own souls because tell me you are dear unto us if you are a leader the members will be dear unto you the members will be precious unto you if you are you know house fellowship leader uh, the members will be very precious to you if you are a local uh, pastor the members of that will be dear to you it will moderate your moving around you know it will moderate your i want to take excuse i don't think i can be in the house fellowship today those people are not precious to you i want to go and attend to something there and something there those people are not precious to you but paul the apostle said that these members were so they were um, they were so precious to them uh, that they desire to be with them look at verse 9 for you remember brethren our labor and travail our labor and travail you know some people they have this uh, language i don't want to die i cannot die on the work of god why not why not such a language but you look at paul the apostle he said our our labor and travail. You will labor Amen. and you will travail. And then it goes on to say for our laboring night and day because we will not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached the word, we preach unto you the gospel of God. Look at their lives. Verse 10, ye are witnesses and God also. How? Tell me. And and I pray the Lord will make your life to be like that. It says here, witnesses and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believed. And then you are heavenward. Your point, yourself, your heart is in heaven. Your mind is in heaven. Your goal is heaven. Your destiny is heaven. And your affection is set on heaven. And you are also influencing the members, the people you are teaching to have heaven in their mind. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 16. Hebrews 11. We're reading from verse 16. Here it says in verse 16, but now the desire a better country you yourself as a leader as a preacher as a pastor you'll desire heaven the better country and then you make the members of the church the people who are listening to you you make them to desire that better country desire heaven when temptation comes to them they'll consider i don't want to yield to that i want to get to heaven when there is any difficult situation i don't want to backslide i want to get to heaven you make the minds of the people search on heaven it says in Hebrews 11 verse 16, but now they desire a better country that is an heavenly wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God and therefore he has prepared for them a city. He has prepared for me. 
he has prepared for you you'll be there in jesus name we're looking at colossians chapter 3 colossians chapter 3 and i'm reading here from verse 1 colossians chapter 3 verse 1 if ye then be risen with christ seek those things which are above where christ seated on the right hand of god he says, since we are uh, risen together with Christ, we seek the things that are above. Where Christ is seated on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above. Set your affection on things above. People should know that you are heavenly minded. And the people should know that you love to get to heaven. And you do everything to get to heaven. And then you believe in salvation, sanctification, holiness that will help people to get to heaven. And you are at peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord because you want to get to heaven and you influence other people that heaven will be uppermost in their heart whatever you are doing you are testifying you are teaching you are preaching or you are encouraging or you are counseling or whatever you are witnessing you make people to desire heaven to set their affection on things above and not on things on the earth for ye are dead and your life is seen with Christ in God when Christ will so our life shall appear then shall ye also appear with him in glory you'll be there i said you'll be there isaiah chapter 52 in isaiah chapter 52 i read from verses 7 and 8 isaiah chapter 52 we're reading from verses 7 and 8 isaiah chapter what Open your Bible, Isaiah chapter 52. We're reading from verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bring it to good tidings. You'll bring good tidings. You'll bring the gospel and good word from the cross of Calvary that will turn people around and convert their souls in Jesus' name. The publishes peace that bringeth good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, salvation. The gospel will preach, the good news will give, is to bring people to salvation, that saith unto Zion, that God reigneth. And then those of us who are witnessing, those of us who are preaching, those of us who are declaring that good news, look at our lives, look at verse 8, thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. Are you here, amen? amen? You lift up your voice. Amen. Difficulties will not drown your voice. Amen. Fear will not drown your voice. Amen. It says the watchmen shall lift up the voice. Well, the voice together, together shall they sing. For they shall see. For they shall see. Uh, look up here, look up here. You know, there are some people, anytime they want to be in a disagreement mode, disagree mode, they say, I just don't see eye to eye with him. I just don't see eye to eye with that uh, leader. You know, he's going this direction. This is what he sees and this is what he wants to do. I'm, this is the way I see it. They don't see eye to eye. But you know, if the watchmen are going to do something that will bring people into the kingdom, if the watchmen are going to succeed in the work of God, if the watchmen are going to fulfill the calling you know, of the watchmen, they will see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring a Again, Zion. That is what will bring restoration when we see eye to eye. Thank God I see eye to eye with you. And thank God you see eye to eye with me. We're not fighting, we're not tearing things apart, we're not saying, pull this now, drive this one there, drive this one there. And then, you know, since we came, I've been watching everybody, the usher said, uh, sit down there, we we'll just quietly sit down there, and then they say, you are there, and then we we'll make announcement, everybody, this is this, and this is this, it's a beautiful unity. And I pray that this beautiful unity will continue every time in our midst in Jesus' name. No fighting. Any fight in your local church, you know, find somebody there again with that person. I said, no, that one is not deeper life. And then that other one saying, no, I will not do that. No, you cannot control me. No, you cannot direct me. I don't accept that. I say, look at that. Then I look at the assembly. I say, thank God that is not deeper life. Deeper life, people, you are united people. Yeah. And we we'll see eye to eye. And as we see eye to eye, this work you will do more than you have ever done more anointing upon you 
more grace upon your life and great great victory will come through you in jesus name and look at jeremiah jeremiah i'm reading from chapter three jeremiah chapter chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 15 jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15 and i will give you pastors according to my own heart i will give you pastors according to my own heart you see pastors that are not according to the heart of god will not do the congregation any good and preachers that are not to the heart of god will not do the congregation any good workers and uh, witnesses and watchmen that are not according to the mind of god will not do us any good and i will give you pastors according to my heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding feed you with knowledge and understanding did you say amen? amen and it shall come to pass in verse 16 we shall the when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days says the lord they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the lord neither shall it come to mind neither shall they remember it neither shall they visit it neither shall it be done anymore at that time when there's unity at that time when we see eye to eye at that time shall they call jerusalem the throne of the lord and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart in those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel this section will match of this section this section will cooperate with that section this section will go along with that section and as we go along and as we march together and as we flow together great will be the progress in jesus name and it says and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that i have given for an inheritance unto your fathers it will happen in your own day it will happen at your own time but remember is the pastoral unity of honest watchmen the pastoral unity of holy watchmen the pastoral unity of heavenly watchmen heaven watch uh, watchmen we're looking at this uh, at romans romans chapter 15 romans chapter 15 uh, and i'm reading from verse 4 romans chapter 15 uh, i'm reading here from verse 4 it says in romans chapter 15 uh, verse 4 for whatsoever ever things were written a full time all that were being reading all the illustrations all the examples and all the precepts and all the commandments whatsoever things were written a full time uh, were written for our learning are you learning something yeah. have you learned something today they're written for our learning and it says that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope now look at this the god of patience the god of tell me the God of, tell me out aloud, the God of patience, you see the people, they're not patient with the newcomers. They're not patient with any newcomers. They're not patient with their fellow brother, their fellow sister. But it says the God of patience and the consolation grant you to be like-minded one to another. Like-minded one to another. Amen. Saying the same thing one with another. Going the same direction, one with another. Having the same goal, one to another. And then he goes on to say, one to another, according to Christ Jesus. Look at verse 6. Look at this one. That ye may with one and one. You see, one mind, one mind. That means we might the same thing. That means we say the same thing. That means we think in the same way. That means we're going the same direction. And says with one mouth, that's unity. What we say, what we teach, how we preach, what we preach, with one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the amen there. Yeah. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading from verse 10. Now I beseech you. 
here is the apostle and he's talking to the whole church and he says now i beseech you brethren by the name of our lord jesus christ that she all say it that she all everybody everybody that she all speak the same thing no discordant voice the same doctrine the same teaching the same emphasis the same christian experiences you see discordant voices and disunited parents cannot raise a united family where the husband and the wife where they're always arguing always disagreeing they cannot raise a united family contradicting and the competing apostles could not have raised up a strong united sanctified church look at the church in the acts of the apostles it's because those apostles were united those apostles were sanctified and those apostles had the same mind and the same mouth and they said the same thing that's how the victory came a dishonest minister cannot lead members to become honest a lazy easy going care leader cannot have a committed hard working diligent followership and then a disagreeable contentious argumentative pastor cannot influence or inspire the local church to be meek to be loving to be obedient an earthbound lukewarm preacher cannot help his hearers to be heavenly minded and zealous and so for the sake of the never dying souls who are ministering to for the sake of uh, the ignorant, uh, innocent uh, people uh, that are under our care, we must be honest. You will be honest. We must be holy. You will be holy. We must be faithful. You will be faithful. We must be honest. You will be honest. We must be zealous. You'll be zealous in Jesus' name. And we'll be active and proactive. We'll be committed to the unity of leadership. We'll sacrifice self and take saints to heaven. It will happen through you. And look at that first Corinthians again. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren by the name of the lord jesus that she all speak tell me once again the same thing and that there be no division there be no contradiction there be no schism there be no disunity there will there should be no contention among you but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment amen Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, I'm reading here from verse 27. Philippians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 27. He's still talking about a unity. He's talking about a we with one strength and one mouth and one decision. We are pursuing those souls and we're saying the same thing. We're going the same direction. Philippians chapter 1 and verse what? 27. Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. Your conversation, your communication, your passion, and your preaching the gospel. Only let your conversation and manner of life be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your fears that you stand or stand. That you stand fast. Tell me. Tell me that again. And then what follows? What on mind? What, what, you see the unity? That's the unity the Lord wants us to have in the work of the Lord, in the preaching of the gospel. It says that you stand together, stand fast in one spirit and with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And whatever our title, and whatever our function, and whatever our responsibility, this unity will keep the unity in Jesus' name. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, remember, it requires humility. Remember, it requires helping each other. Remember, it requires harmlessness. Remember, it requires honesty. Remember, it requires holiness. Remember, it requires heavenly mindedness. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 4, and I read here from verse 3. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep 
the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring to keep, that is, you'll do everything on your side. I will not be disagreeable. I will not be contentious. I will not cause division. I will not cause schism in the house of God. I will endeavor. I will do everything I need to do, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Look at verse 11. And he gave some, tell me. Is everybody apostle? And he gave some, tell me again. And some, and some, and some, and he gave some apostles, and he gave some prophets, and he gave some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Look at this. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till, till, we all come in the unity of the faith. That's the purpose. That's the goal. And that's what the word is doing in your heart tonight. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, ignorant children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth, how? Speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplied, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, every part, every part, that is, everyone contributing to the progress, contributing to the productivity, and contributing to the purpose, why the church was raised up, making makes increase of the body unto the defining of itself in love. Your local church will increase. Amen. And local churches everywhere will increase. Amen. And the church in the whole region, in the whole state, in the whole nation will increase in multiplied fold in Jesus' name. Amen. You are part of it. Amen. I'm part of it. And all of us will work together in unity together to see the purpose of the church fulfilled through every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you part of this? Yes. I said, are you part of this? Yes. Where are you there? Let me see your hand. Let me hear your voice. I am part of this. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord and let this unity be practical. Let this unity be purposeful. Let this unity be productive. And let this unity be spiritual. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, I'm part of this, I'm part of this, and I'm going to contribute to the unity and to the progress of the church. Make sure that God does a great work in your heart to bring about this unity before you go tonight.